what I want to do today is talk about patterns of species diversity um, and community stability. Uh, and those two things are, I think, extremely important, uh, especially as you go forward and uh, pursue your career and whatever it's going to be, whether it's education or medicine or whatever. Uh, it's good to have uh, a basic understanding of why um, nature is as we see it. So uh, let's begin by talking about species diversity. So the first thing uh, that you've probably already noticed if you if you have a bird feeder out behind your house or you've just been paying attention to uh, the wildlife that you see um, is you notice that many species are really common um, and every now and then you'll see something that is rare that's unexpected. Uh, so we know that if you take a sample out of a community you usually find a few species um, that are always there and every now and then you'll see something that that is unusual. Uh, this just over the last couple of weeks if I've gone out and looked at the feeders or the birds that come to my feeders uh, primarily what I see are cardinals and uh, common house finches and then some wrens, uh, some chickadees, nuthatches, um, hairy woodpeckers and, and those are the species that I see on a daily basis. But every now and then uh, you'll see a rose-breasted grosbeak or an indigo bunting or something of that sort. So they're rare. The point is that most of what you see is common and then there are a few things that uh, you only see occasionally. Uh, and that's a sort of pattern that we see again and again and again. Uh, when I go out trapping uh, at Kelso Sanctuary or something like that, uh, primarily what I'm going to catch are uh, Blorina carolinensis, or, um, which is the short-tailed shrew, um, and Paramiscus leucopus, which is the, um, um, the deer mouse, or rather the white-footed mouse. Um, then, on occasion, every now and then, you'll catch Microtus pinnatorum, which is the pine bull, and then the golden mouse, which is Ocrotomes natali. The point is that usually what you're seeing is the stuff that's common. Uh, hidden behind all of that are species that are rare. And it turns out that that kind of distribution follows a logarithmic distribution. Uh, and here you see what that logarithmic distribution uh, looks like. So we're not going to worry about what all of these terms are. Um, the point I want to make, though, is that if we were to, you can see what the sequence is, what the series is. Uh, the next term is obviously going to be alpha x to the fifth divided by five. Uh, and if you go into Excel and you, you plot all of that out, what you'll discover is that at one end you have a very uh, a large number, and then as you go farther and farther and farther out to the right, the numbers become smaller and smaller and smaller. So if you were to go into, um, for example, butterfly collections at the British Museum of Natural History, um, and, and so one of the things that happens in, um, in England in particular is that gentlemen uh, collect butterflies, and that was true when Darwin uh, in the time of Darwin, it certainly preceded Darwin, um, and uh, the gentlemen are well connected, right? They have lots of money, so they have leisure, and, and one of the things they do is they put together these glorious butterfly collections. And then when they die, those collections get deposited in the, in the British Museum of Natural History. And if you go into that collection, you can very easily get a lot of ecological data. And that data today is used for all sorts of things, including um, studies on patterns uh, that result from climate change and so on. Uh, but one of the things that you notice is uh, what you see here in this particular graph. Uh, so these were out of a butterfly collection uh, made in England back in 1935. Uh, and if you look at the x-axis, that is uh, the number of individuals represented in in a particular sample. So on the far right there, you see the number 40. Um, so that is uh, the number of um, uh, the the number of species um, that had 40 individuals in it. So it's number of individuals on the x-axis, and then on the y-axis is number of species. Uh, so the number of species that had 40 individuals in it was somewhere south of five. Okay, so five species had roughly 40. Um, a couple of species had 39, 38, and so on. 
Now go to the other end of that axis where you see 1 and look at the number of species that had just one um, individual. So there, there was only one member of that species represented in the sample. And there you see that it's uh, 35, 36, 37 species had but a single individual represented in the sample. In other words, um, most of what you see is relatively common, but then there are going to be lots of species that are incredibly rare. So that pattern that you see there follows precisely this logarithmic curve or this logarithmic pattern, this log logarithmic, logarithmic series um, that you saw in the previous slide. So the question then becomes, what does that tell us about the structure of communities? And, and that's kind of a difficult uh, thing to address. Um, first of all, we need to ask what we mean by structure of communities. Uh, well, we know a little bit about that already. We've talked about species packing, uh, niche breadth, uh, species that are specialist, species that are generalist, and so on and how you get more species into a community. Uh, one of the things that we care about when we're talking about the structure of the community is the species diversity that's in the community. So not simply how many species are there in the system, but how, how are those species represented? In other words, if there are lots of species and each species is rare, that might mean something different from a situation where you have fewer species, but every species is common. So that's the thing that we want to get a handle on. And in order to do that, what we what we need is some index, some way of measuring um, that pattern of diversity. And the most common tool that we use for that is something referred to as the Shannon Wiener Diversity Index. Uh, and this is a, an index that was developed by Shannon and Wiener separately, and as in many cases, they both end up getting credit for it. Uh, so this actually comes uh, not directly from biology, but it comes from information theory. So if, you're, uh, if you've taken a lot of courses in computer science or something of that sort, you've probably seen this particular uh, index before. Uh, but if you look at it, H prime is our... Um, diversity, and it's equal to minus times the sum of p sub i times the natural log of p sub i, where p sub i uh, is the proportionate representation of a particular species of species i in the community. So p sub i is the proportion of the ith species in the total sample of s species. Um, and this index has this rather pleasing property, um, and that is that if you have an uneven distribution of um, species or an uneven abundance of species in the community, it ends up giving you a value which is somewhat less. So the greater the evenness within the community, the higher the diversity value, and, and that makes sense. Uh, so let's do an example. Um, let's compute our diversity index, H prime, uh, for each of the following scenarios. So community one is going to have 90 individuals of species A and 10 individuals of species B. Community two will have 50 of species A and 50 of species B. Community of three will have 80 of A, uh, 10 of B, and 10 of C. And community four will have 33 and a third of A, 33 and a third of B, and 33 and a third of C. So now, even before we uh, try and figure this out, think to yourself, which of those has the greatest diversity of species? What do you think? Okay, now that you've done those computations or you've, you've thought about it a little bit, what you end up with is this, community one. Um, has a diversity value of 0.33 uh, and so on. Uh, the highest diversity value is for community 4 uh, with a value of 1.1. Um, now, if you think about that, uh, community 4 had an even distribution of each species, so 33 and a third percent of species A, species B, and species C. 
Um, so that makes sense, right? If we have an even distribution of species, uh, that tends to give us a higher diversity value than if, if we don't. Um, so so communities that have more species um, tend to have a higher diversity value and not only having more species, but also having a more even distribution of species. Now, uh, what's going to happen this uh, on the mini exam is this. I'm not going to provide a key points uh, page this time around. Uh, instead, I'm going to tell you right now what's going to end up on the mini exam. Uh, the first question that I'm going to ask you um, is uh, just um, what the pattern of um, species abundance within a community is. What kind of a pattern does it follow? Well, it follows that nice logarithmic pattern, right? Uh, the second question on your mini exam is going to be one in which you have to compute what the diversity value is for a particular community. I'll keep it relatively simple, um, but I'll give you how many individuals are in each um, species in a particular sample. And then what you're going to have to do is compute what the PI is. Uh, and then you'll take the log of that PI and then you can compute it. Now, uh, because of that, um, I know that you're probably not going to do this in your head, especially with natural logarithms. logarithms. Um, so this particular mini exam is not going to be timed. Okay, you can uh, take as much time as you need to complete it. Um, so no worries there. So the next thing um, that we want to think about a little bit is what the evenness is. And it turns out that computing evenness is pretty straightforward. Um, so again, what is evenness? That's when all the species in the community have equal representation. Uh, and we denote evenness with a new term, J. So for diversity, we had H prime. Uh, for evenness, we have J prime. And all we're doing is we're computing the evenness value is simply going to be what our computed diversity value is divided by the greatest possible diversity value for that number of species. Well, it turns out the greatest possible diversity value is going to be when the number of species or when all of the species in the community have exactly the same representation. Okay, so on your MIDI exam, the next question you're going to get is to compute what the diversity or rather what the evenness value is for the community that you just assessed in the second question. Now, uh, when you do these uh, problems, uh, it is very important to remember that uh, when we computed the species diversity, uh, there was a negative sign in front of that um, capital sigma. So whenever you compute that diversity value, you need to multiply it times whatever the ultimate sum is. You need to multiply that times minus one so that your diversity values end up being positive. So uh, we know that maximum diversity happens when um, each species has exactly the same proportionate representation in the community as every other species. Now it turns out um, that when we compute or when we estimate those diversity values, um, the values that we come up with are really um, only comparable to that particular study. It's very difficult to make those sorts of comparisons across studies. And the reason for that is simply that uh, sampling methods are so different from one study to the next. Time of year has an effect. Um, time of day has an effect. Uh, if you're sampling insects, or, or better yet, let's imagine you're working on birds and you want to assess uh, the species diversity pattern for birds, well, if you're there very early in the spring and assessing species diversity uh, just by sightings or just by songs, you'll come up with one value. Had you been there two weeks later into the spring, you might have had a whole host of different species there simply because songbirds are migratory. Or perhaps your ability to identify birds by their calls is not as good or perhaps better than the next scientist that comes along and does it.
So when we're looking at these diversity values, we have to be cognizant to the fact that they are um, study specific. So in that regard, uh, when we're trying to evaluate patterns of diversity, uh, oftentimes what we do is we rely on a different sort of metric, um, something that's actually much simpler. So instead of trying to do these complicated diversity indices, right, when we're comparing one study with another study, we simply look at species richness. That is, how many total species were in the system regardless of evenness, regardless of what the proportionate representation was. So on a broad scale, when we're comparing these values across large areas or across many years or across many different studies, oftentimes we just look at species richness. What is species richness? Simply the number of species that were observed in the community. And that is the next question on your mini exam. What is species richness? So here's just a bit of advice. Um, I, I suggest you, you, if you haven't already done so, stop the lecture right now, uh, stop the video right now, um, and open up the mini exam. So there's uh, make your life easy, Let, do this all in one shot. Okay, uh, you can pause here. You have all the time you need to complete this mini exam. It's not timed. Um, so go back and answer the first few questions. Um, and then uh, proceed at this point. Okay, so as we're going along, I'll announce when the questions are coming up, uh, and you could just complete them as we go. So by the time you're done with this lecture, you're also done with a mini exam, uh, and you're free, free, free. All right, all right, so let's continue. Uh, so let's now look at gradients of species diversity. Um, and we know, and, and you probably understand that already, that if you go to the tropics, you discover many more species than if you go to the extreme northern latitudes or extreme southern latitudes. So there's this general pattern. There are some exceptions to that pattern, uh, but for the most part, species diversity decreases as you go to the poles. And when we talked about um, our eight hypotheses for um, species diversity. I mean, we you have eight good reasons for why that might be, but uh, the fact is that that pattern uh, seems to hold up. Uh, as an example, uh, just within the Amazon River, there are a thousand species of fish. Um, if you go to Central America, um, in a major river system there, you'll find about 450 fish. Um, by the time you get to the Great Lakes, you are down to about 172 fish. Um, Using ants in Alaska, there are seven species of ants. If you go to Iowa, there are 73 species, uh, 101 in Cuba, 134 in Trinidad, which is one of the greater Antilles, or one of the Antilles, um, and then 222 in Brazil. So there's this pattern as you go towards the equator, um, species diversity increases. As you go towards the poles, species diversity decreases. Now, as I mentioned, there are a couple of examples where this pattern doesn't hold true, and, and that uh, is true for sandpipers and, and aphids. It's not exactly clear to me why that should be true for aphids, um, but for sandpipers, uh, it makes sense. I mean, sandpipers are, are coastal birds, right? And there is a whole heck of a lot more coastline as you go to northern latitudes than there is um, around the equator. So there, it might simply be an area effect. So here, for example, if you're looking at the diversity of mammals um, on the x-axis is, uh, is um, uh, increasing latitude. So as you go, uh, it goes from northern latitudes on the left to southern latitudes on the right. Um, and you look at what happens to the number of species, it increases pretty dramatically. Um, and if you stop to think about it, that, that makes absolute sense. Uh, how many species of mammals are there that can really tolerate the, the extreme conditions that you find at the Arctic Circle? And the answer is not many. Um, you're probably fil familiar with Bergman's rule, which states that as you go north, um, as you go towards the, the poles, uh, mammals tend to become larger. And that's certainly true. The mice that you find at the poles are bigger. Um, the bears that you find at the poles are bigger, right? 
Um, there are some exceptions, but for the most part, the average body mass of mammals increases as you go north. And of course, that's all about surface area to volume ratio and, and heat conservation and all of those sorts of issues. But when you think about what mammals come to mind when you think about the Arctic, you think about polar bears, um, you think about um, uh, Arctic foxes, uh, seals, um, and things of that sort, caribou, uh, so it, it tends to be big stuff rather than little stuff. As you go down towards uh, the deserts or whatever, the animals tend to become very much smaller. And if you look at isoclines for the diversity of mammals across North America, um, you come up with something that looks like this. And you, you see that as you go up to the north, um, the number of mammal species uh, decreases pretty dramatically. And if you look at this map, you'll see that there are some real hot spots of mammals. Um, so there are some areas, even within the continental United States, uh, where the diversity seems to be very much greater. And notice that that's concentrated um, right there in the area of around Arizona and southeastern New, or southwestern New Mexico, um, and then also around the Great Basin and the Sierras and all of that sort of stuff. Well, there it has a lot to do with habitat heterogeneity, all right? So the diversity of habitats that are available. Um, that circle right there in, in uh, southeastern Arizona, southwestern New Mexico, those are um, the Chiricahua Mountains uh, and Animas Peak. Um, that's an area where suddenly you have these sky islands, uh, so it's a, a, an incredibly rich habitat. And if you ever get the opportunity to go down uh, to Portal, Arizona, or uh, Hidalgo County, New Mexico, it, as a biologist, uh, especially as a, as a vertebrate biologist, it will, um, it will truly amaze you. It's really a beautiful place. When you look at the isoclines for birds in North America, it's the same sort of um, it's the same sort of picture, right? The pattern is the pattern is very um, is very similar. Um, if you notice that again, you have these these uh, diversity hot spots. Um, here it's just a little bit different. Um, there is one hot spot which is right there um, in Southern California. I think that's the Anza Borrego um, Desert. Um, Let's see, where else do we have hot spots? Uh, again, around Portal, Arizona. Um, yeah, right there above Baja. So that's the Anza Borrego Desert. And then, of course, in the Sierras and so on. As you go down into Central America, notice what happens to the diversity of birds. It becomes absolutely insane. So there, the diversity is really very much higher. The point is that as you go north, the diversity decreases. As you go south, the diversity increases. As you get into areas where you have greater um, topographical um, diversity, habitat heterogeneity, species diversity increases. When it becomes flatter, more mundane, then species diversity decreases. So we've talked about uh, what causes those patterns uh, in previous lectures already. Uh, we've talked about competition and predation. Uh, about ecological time and evolutionary time. A uh, big part of it, in this case, is going to be spatial heterogeneity. So um, when you get a lot of topographical relief, uh, if you think about the Sierras or the Rocky Mountains, the habitats that you find at high elevations are fundamentally different than habitats that you find at low elevations. And as a result, you find different species there. So those those species diversity patterns are oftentimes associated with that kind of topographical relief. Of course, the other hypotheses are all about uh, productivity, um, primary productivity, um, and climatic stability, and, and we've talked about that a little bit um, as well. And then there's this also idea, also this idea of area. Um, in if you have a, a large area of habitat, um, it gives you the chance for isolation between populations uh, increasing, um, and with that isolation comes the potential for speciation. So that's another possibility. There is another rather sort of interesting um, hypothesis that's been floated, and that's uh, referred to as the animal pollinators hypothesis. Uh, and essentially what that means is that in areas where um, you have uh, a lot of vegetation in the tropics, um, 
in places where there's a lot of humidity, uh, you get less wind, um, and it's certainly a lower intensity than it is in temperate zones. Um, and that then results in greater vegetative cover. Um, and it also means that with less wind, uh, there are fewer plants that are being pollinated by the wind, and more plants are being pollinated by insects and and birds and mice and things of that sort. Um, so it's that sort of poll pollinator um, plant interaction, which then results in greater species diversity for the pollinators. So that that's one um, hypothesis that's been floated. Uh, if you live in Missouri, you're, you're probably not familiar with what, what extreme wind conditions are really like, except during tornado outbreaks or something. Uh, if you've ever been out west uh, on some of the mountain passes in the, um, in the southern Sierras, uh, the winds can get extreme, so, and they happen every day. Um, in particular, if you think about Walker Pass, which is there, the southern uh, most extension of the Sierra Nevada Mountains, um, right there in the Tehachapis, um, at low elevation right below you, you have the um, the Mojave Desert, and then right above you is Kern County and, and um, Ponderosa Pine Woodlands and all of that, and there's this nice V-shaped pass there. Uh, it's one of the places where if you ever hike the Pacific Crest Trail, you can uh, get on and get off right there at that point. Um, but if you stay there uh, as the sun begins to set, um, the temperature difference um, is extreme between the low elevations and the high elevations. And hot air begins moving off the desert and up those passes. Um, and it is just extreme. I mean, the, the winds on a regular basis are well over 65 miles an hour. And you see that in, in other places as well. Uh, if you've ever come through um, Wyoming on Interstate 90, I think it is, or Interstate 80, when you're coming um, uh, between Cheyenne and Laramie, that pass that goes right through there, the winds can get absolutely insane. And it's all because of those temperature differentials. Um, so those sorts of uh, wind events uh, do have an effect on the uh, the animals and the plants that you see there. And of course, the converse is true. If you have no wind, right, then it's not, doesn't make any sense to rely on wind for pollination. So now let's think a little bit about community stability. Um, and we're going to think about it in a couple of ways. Uh, what I really mean by stability is the ability of a community to resist change following disturbance. Uh, so we'll refer to that as community resistance, or the ability of a community to return to its original configuration after perturbation, and that's going to be community resilience. Um, so in order to help you think about those things, just think a little bit about the sort of uh, phase plane analyses that we did with the Lotka-Volterra competition equations, and we were talking about uh, stable limit cycles, ones that attract and go back to the equilibrium point, and others that cycle out away from equilibrium. Uh, so there are two ideas here. One is community resistance. Uh, that's the ability to res resist change. And the other is um, community resilience, and that is the ability of the community to return to its uh, pre-disturbance uh, configuration. And here we can think, uh, we can do a comparison. Um, we can compare, for example, deserts and estuaries. Um, deserts have high resistance, um, but they have low resilience. On the other hand, estuaries have low resistance, but high resilience. And uh, let me just show you a couple of images uh, that might drive that, um, that point home. So here you see um, an example of uh, what a pretty standard Mojave Desert landscape looks like. Uh, so there on the lower right-hand side, uh, you see creosote bush, um, uh, Laria tridentata, and then um, next to it, the, the lighter colored bushes, that's um, sagebrush. Uh, sagebrush is kind of interesting. It, it goes all the way up into the Great Basin. So as you'll recall, we have... Um, uh, three major deserts, uh, four major deserts in uh, in North America, the Mojave, the Sonoran, the Great Basin Desert, and then the Chihuahuan uh, Desert. Uh, well, the sagebrush gets all the way up into the Chihuahuan. Uh, this next image, 
Uh, this next image is of the Sonoran Desert, and the Sonoran Desert is um, populated with, um, uh, and I've forgotten what the common name of these uh, plants with the red flowers are. It's in the family Fuquaaceae. Um, but aside from that, you see the tall cacti there. Um, those are saguaro cacti. Uh, they are an indicator species for the Sonoran Desert. Uh, when you see those sonora, when you see those saguaro cacti, you know that that particular location right there has never experienced frost. Um, saguaro cacti die uh, in any kind of a frost, so um, the saguaro cacti that you see there could all easily be well over a hundred years old, uh, very slow growing. Uh, you see a lot of apuntia cactus and barrel cactus there in the foreground, uh, so very rich, very diverse kind of habitat. Um, so remember, uh, what the deserts um, have is they have high resistance but low resilience. And with that, I'd like you to look at the next figure. Um, here you see an image from uh, a motorcycle race that happens every year in the Mojave Desert. Uh, every year, um, there are 3,000 plus motorcycles that line up in Barstow, California and race from Barstow, California across the Mojave. Uh, up to Las Vegas, Nevada, um, and they are racing without mufflers or any sound production or anything of that sort. Um, and the devastation that they um, impart on the vegetation is extreme. Uh, so the desert resists change, but it's not resilient. So in other words, it doesn't return to its normal state uh, very readily or very easily. Uh, the habitat damage inflicted by this race is extreme. Um, and as a matter of fact, when I was in graduate school uh, in California, uh, one of my lab partners was working on um, this particular race, uh, looking at what the, uh, not what the vegetative effects were, but what the acoustic effects were. And he trapped uh, desert iguanas, and he also trapped kangaroo rats. And uh, we've talked about kangaroo rats when we talked about anti-predation strategies, the fact that they have these very large auditory bullae. Um, and what he discovered was that after this race, when you go out and trap the kangaroo rats, the back of the heads of all of these kangaroo rats are bloody, and that's because their auditory bullet have actually exploded. Um, so they are from that point forward, they're, they're deaf. Uh, and the same is true for the desert iguanas. Um, they're deaf permanently following this race. And of course, if they're deaf, then their susceptibility to protection goes way up. Um, so one other interesting point, uh, you can still go out into the Mojave today um, and see where Sherman uh, trained his tank corps in preparation for the Second World War. So all the tracks left by Sherman uh, and all those tanks are still there today. So um, it is deserts are resistant to change, but they're not very resilient. So they don't return to the pre-disturbance uh, condition very easily. Uh, just to give you uh, what the, the flavor of uh, some of uh, North America's other great deserts, this is the Great Basin Desert here. Uh, and you can see in the foreground, uh, there's some sagebrush. Um, I can't tell from this photograph what the other um, plants are there, but there's going to be a bunch grass sagebrush. Uh, and then also in areas that are um, more disturbed in the Great Basin, you'll find a plant which is referred to as cheat grass. Uh, cheat grass was introduced from Asia because the idea was that they could grow this readily in the Great Basin and it would provide good food for cattle. Uh, and it turns out that cattle completely ignore it. So it's an invasive species uh, and there's a, a great deal of effort um, trying to extirpate uh, this pest species. Um, but it's a very different kind of landscape compared to either the Sonoran or the Mojave deserts. Uh, and then here uh, you see a, uh, an image from the Chihuahuan Desert. So there uh, in the lower right, you see a sotol plant, um, and a, a, it's a kind of agave. Uh, sotol is used um, to make uh, mezcal. If, you, if you're ever south of the border uh, and you can't afford tequila uh, and you need some alcohol for whatever medicinal purpose you require, um, you can you can get this alcohol made from sotol, and it's it's referred to as mezcal. Um, it's pretty rough stuff. Uh, it can be really good, um, but for the most part, what you'll buy in these little villages is pretty rough. Uh, but it's a very beautiful landscape. So again, deserts have um, high resistance, 
but low resilience. Uh, compared with estuaries, um, estuaries are, are habitats that have this sort of tidal flux. Um, so the um, the pH, or not the pH, the salinity of the water changes based on the tide. Uh, so when the tide comes in, then the salinity of the water goes up, and as the tide goes out, uh, the seawater is being replaced with, with fresh water, so the salinity goes down. Uh, so this is a habitat that has low resistance, but high resilience, so it returns to its normal condition pretty readily. Uh, these sorts of estuaries, it turns out, um, have the greatest productivity of any, of any habitat um, in the world, right? So this is where most of the primary production is taking place. Uh, this is also the kind of habitat that used to be at the mouth of the Mississippi River. And of course, it's a habitat that is disappearing uh, simply because of the lack of deposition of sand and whatnot um, at the base of the Mississippi. And that's a consequence of channelization of the Mississippi. Um, but at any rate, uh, estuaries have low resistance but high resilience. Uh, I want to sort of work into um, a discussion of um, island biogeography. Um, but before I do that, I want to say just a couple of words about uh, community stability. So we've talked about resistance and resilience. Um, but there um, are a couple of other uh, ideas that I want to get across as well. Uh, and one of those is that small um, islands that don't have a great deal of um, species diversity are pretty vulnerable to invading species, much more so than a larger continent is. Um, although you might, uh, if you've been watching the news, um, there is an outbreak of these uh, wasps that have been introduced from Japan um, that are, uh, it's pretty remarkable. These wasps are, are quite large. I think they're uh, an inch, inch and a half um, in length, and they're referred to as murder wasps. Um, and what these wasps do is they uh, they prey on honeybees, and in Washington State, uh, within uh, within a very short period of time, uh, a number of these wasps can completely wipe out uh, an entire honeybee colony. Um, so there's an example of an invading species uh, on the mainland. But for the most part, uh, those sorts of invasions are much easier on habitat islands that are uh, relatively small and have a uh, low faunistic diversity. Um, the other place where you see outbreaks are in cultivated areas. Um, or uh, another way of looking at that is uh, anthropogenetic, anthropogenetically uh, modified habitats. So whenever you have human disturbance, um, you end up getting a lot of invasive species. Um, you don't see that so much in the tropics, right? Um, but you see it an awful lot in in uh, anthropogenic areas. Well, of course, that may change now with the amount of uh, disturbance that's taking place in the tropics. Um, but in in habitats where uh, it's faunistically more simple, right, as in a cultivated landscape, um, a cornfield or a soybean field is faunistically pretty darn simple. It's a monoculture. And under those sorts of circumstances, it's easy to get invasive species. So um, another factor which uh, plays into all of that is uh, the use of pesticides um, that we use to control uh, outbreaks. Oftentimes, those pesticides that we use have the opposite effect because one of the things that happens, and this is especially true if you think back to the use of DDT, um, I'm sure that DDT has been outlawed uh, throughout your entire life, but it was a big deal when I was a kid growing up. Um, I don't recall what the, the full chemical name is, but this was a pesticide that uh, was applied to crops to, to kill insects, and it did a very good job of killing the insects. Um, but the other thing that it did was uh, because the birds um, and other animals were feeding on, still feeding on the insects, um, there was a dramatic decline in the number of eagles and so on. So lots of other bird species were uh, going extinct as a result um, because it influenced the metabolism of calcium in the eggs. Uh, so the consequence was that uh, predator populations were crashing. Uh, the same predators that oftentimes were controlling insects within uh, these crop fields. So it resulted in unintended consequences. Uh, just as a side note, um, I was talking with John Kramer 
about a year ago, um, and he had just come back from the boot heel, and he came across a barn uh, in the boot heel, and inside this barn, uh, there was a farmer that had 55-gallon drums still loaded with DDT that he had been storing for all of these years. He still used the stuff, um, and he thought it was a conspiracy on the part of the government to ruin his livelihood or something. Uh, so he'd stockpile DDT, even though it's highly illegal. You can't have that stuff. It's, it's, it's bad news all around. Uh, so at any rate, um, if you look at food webs, we can start asking a little bit about the complexity and, and how that relates to stability. And it turns out that food webs that are more complex also turn out to be more stable. Um, and food webs um, are, w when we're thinking about food webs, what we're really thinking about is the movement of energy from one trophic level um, to the next. So one of the things that happens is if you have um, a community or an ecosystem uh, which fluctuates a lot, which is extremely variable, um, that experiences lots and lots of perturbations, um, it turns out that the, um, the stability of the food webs, the complexity of the food webs, is lower. If you're in a system that is really stable, um, the complexity and stability of those food webs is greater. Rather than get deep into the woods on uh, all the mathematics and theory and whatnot behind uh, stability, uh, community stability, uh, let's simplify the discussion a little bit and uh, look at it in this nice diagrammatic fashion. Uh, what I've uh, illustrated here are a number of communities, um, and these are uh, referred to as food webs. Um, and each line represents the flow of energy from a lower trophic level up to a higher trophic level. So the producers are down at the bottom uh, and the consumers are at the top. So if we look at number A, uh, we have a series of four species at the bottom. Each of these is, uh, is a producer, so some kind of a plant. Uh, and at the top, there is a single herbivore, which is feeding on those four plants. Uh, contrast that with... Um, with number B, uh, where you see the same sort of situation, right? There are four herbivores on the bottom, but then there's um, a primary consumer uh, above that. Uh, so maybe there's a fox and uh, an opossum or something like that. And then above those two, uh, there's another predator. Perhaps it's a coyote, which is feeding on the fox or, or, um, or on the opossum or something of that sort. Uh, so on the left, we just have two trophic levels uh, in A. In B, there are three trophic levels. Uh, let's compare um, B with C and notice the difference. Uh, now there are two predators up at the top um, and the two predators, uh, maybe it's a coyote and, um, uh, and a fox. And on the lower um, level below that, uh, in the primary consumers, we have perhaps a, a squirrel and a rabbit. Uh, and then below that, we have all the different plant species. Uh, so the question becomes, uh, which of these is most stable, uh, which is most resilient, which can uh, sustain sort of perturbations better than the others? Uh, well, I think we can get a handle on that. Uh, let's look at number E. Uh, so there's, there's, there are a series of diagrams for number E. Let's look at number one. Uh, so here's a very simple sort of food chain. Uh, there is a, a producer at the bottom, and then there's a host of consumers above that. Uh, let's think about uh, number one. Uh, let's imagine that's in a, in a marine ecosystem and the producer down at the bottom is going to be phytoplankton. Uh, well, there is zooplankton in the system and the zooplankton are feeding on the phytoplankton. There are krill, um, that's that third level, which are perhaps feeding on the, uh, on the zooplankton. Uh, and then there are probably fish that are feeding on the krill. And then above that, we're going to have dolphins and whales, which are feeding on the fish. Well, what's going to happen to system number one if something happens to the phytoplankton? If the phytoplankton disappear, for whatever reason, the entire system collapses. Or uh, if the phytoplankton survive, but the zooplankton disappear, then the krill disappear, the fish disappear, and then the porpoises and dolphins disappear as well. Uh, so in that sort of a system, right, it's the loss of one link, which can 
result in collapse of the entire system. Uh, look at number D on the other side. If one of those primary producers disappears, then you lose the consumer above it, right? So you lose one species, that ultimately means that you lose two. So one of the things that happens is this. The more sorts of connections we have in the system, the more resilient, the more stable the system is. So if we compare B with C, B has fewer connections than does C. So C ends up being more stable, more resilient. If you lose one component of C, the system is more likely to persist than if you lose one component in B. So it's the amount of connectivity in the system which promotes stability. One of the unfortunate consequences of, of climate change is that we're losing those connections. So as we lose connections because species are going extinct, because the tolerance limits are being exceeded by the new climate, right? As we lose those connections, the overall stability of the trophic web begins to decline. It becomes less stable. It begins to fluctuate more. And of course, one of the possible consequences of that is extirpation of humans, right? Because we're not at the bottom, certainly, and we're not at the pinnacle, but we are certainly at one of those middle sort of trophic levels. There are, in a natural system, predators that feed on humans, right? We've extirpated most of those and we control the rest, but we're still at a relatively high trophic level. And that also means that we're pretty susceptible to any changes in this particular system. So one of the questions now on your, on your um, mini exam is going to be concerning uh, stability of these trophic webs. Are webs with more connectivity more stable or less stable? Okay, let's uh, switch gears just very briefly and then we'll switch gears again. Um, I want to talk now just uh, very quickly about um, uh, this process referred to or known as succession. Uh, and it's something that you're probably familiar with uh, if you've lived in a, um, if you've lived here in Cape for any period of time and, you, and you've seen what happens when your neighbors don't mow their lawn or something of that sort, or you see a building is torn down and the lot is just left vacant, uh, what happens in that particular lot? Um, that sequence of events is referred to as succession. And as an example, um, I want to talk about uh, the Kelso Sanctuary where where we've uh, been a number of times. In that parking lot where we've parked uh, and we walk up into the woods, uh, that area uh, 30 years ago was all mowed. Uh, and it was actually a pretty extensive field that was mowed. Um, and at some point, uh, roughly 30 years ago or so, um, the Missouri Department of Conservation or the city or whoever decided that they were no longer going to mow that piece of property. Um, and when that happened, the grass started to grow up. But other things occurred as well. Uh, for example, maple seeds, uh, tulip poplar seeds, and so on were blowing in. Um, and uh, the first thing that happened, I suppose, was, was that you got some maples uh, being established. Um, some sassafras trees were established, uh, species that are um, good pioneer species, or we, we often refer to them as weedy species. They began growing up producing shade uh, that changed the thermal environment and the moisture environment below them. Uh, so new plants started to move in. But as you look at it, the composition of plants gradually began to change. And as the trees grew up, they produced more shade, uh, they produced more maples, more more poplars and things of that sort, more sassafras trees. And as that happened, then poison ivy began to move in, other sorts of plants began to move in. But the community is going through a series of steps. It's slowly but surely changing from one kind of habitat into another kind of habitat. And if you were to leave it alone for 600 years and come back and look at it, it would look fundamentally different. In 600 years, all the maples would be gone, all the sassafras trees would be gone, because the tolerance limits of those species 
would be exceeded, they would no longer be able to exist in that habitat. The poison ivy would be gone. What you would find in that old growth habitat is a system where there are these massive trees with an extensive cavity with an extensive canopy and very few plants on the forest floor. So what happens in old growth forest is that there is not a lot growing on the forest floor. All the life is up in the canopy, and that's because you have the solid canopy and it gets very dark on the forest floor, very little light is penetrating, and the forest floor ends up being pretty open. That doesn't mean it's easy to walk through because there will be a lot of trees which have fallen, a lot of snags, a lot of dead stuff on the ground, um, but it is going to be a fundamentally different kind of habitat. As the system becomes old growth in a forest system, uh, we refer to that as the climax community. So there ends up being very little, very little understory. Of course, all it takes is a significant wind event and suddenly a lot of those trees are blown down and now you have an opening in the forest and then this whole process begins again in that opening. You can see that in other sorts of habitats as well. So the system moves from one sort of habitat to another. On the back side of Kelso, where uh, we went in behind the golf course, um, that whole area used to be a residential area and was uh, purchased by the Audubon Society and converted into this bird sanctuary. And what has happened is the same sort of thing. Now, interestingly, around those, uh, the new ponds, and I think we walked past one of those new ponds on one occasion, uh, there used to be a barn there uh, that was a dairy operation. And uh, one of our faculty members way back in the 1980s uh, wanted to establish um, a uh, prairie in that habitat. So it was, at that time, it was all um, uh, fields and barns and things of that sort. Uh, and he asked me what I thought would happen. I said, well, it's going to go through succession and it'll end up being a hardwood deciduous forest. Um, and he was convinced that that wasn't true. Um, so he had the Army Corps of Engineers come in and they bulldozed the barn and they they cleared all of that land and they then planted all of these prairie plants. And of course, the first thing that came back was fescue because that's what was being used on the golf course. And it was it was just in all the neighborhoods around. So it grew up in all this fescue grass and the system became a biological desert because there were no rodents or anything that could could survive in that fescue grass. And he was surprised. And I told him that what he would have to do if he wanted to maintain a prairie was that he was going to have to use fire and burn it or whatever. Um, and he was never willing to do that. So ultimately what ended up happening is it went through succession and now it's back to being hardwood deciduous forest. So the hardwood deciduous forest is the, is the climax community in this particular system. If you go out west and you look at habitats, the climax community is oftentimes not a forest habitat. Sometimes the climax community will be a desert or a grassland or something of that sort. If you've ever been in Kansas on the Kansa Prairie and in the tall in those stands of tall grass prairie, that's the climax community. So it is not always a forest habitat. It can oftentimes be a grassland or something of that sort. So that whole concept is succession. That's when you have a, a habitat which is disturbed, and then the community that's in that particular location changes. It begins as a, as a grassy field uh, and then converts to some sorts of shrubs with all of these pioneer and weedy species coming in. And as the microclimates in that in that new habitat change, it develops into shrublands and then it'll be one kind of forest, maples and, and tulip poplars and, and uh, sassafras trees. And then ultimately the oaks and the hickories and the pecans are going to establish themselves and you ultimately end up with old growth forest. If you go down to Big Oak Tree State Park, um, the reason Oak, Big Oak Tree State Park is there is because it was at one point uh, the last remnant of old growth forest in Missouri. Uh, 
And it is true that there are some very old trees left in Big Oak Tree State Park. Unfortunately, uh, it is a bottomland hardwood forest. Um, and what has happened to Big Oak Tree State Park is that um, the agricultural activities around the park have modified the water flow um, to the point where Big Oak Tree is no longer sustainable as a bottomland hardwood forest. And as a consequence, many of the old growth trees have died and been blown over. And what you have left with now is a highly disturbed patch of forest, which does have some very old trees in it, but it would no longer be considered old growth forest. And you can see that when you're walking around on the boardwalk through the park, there's a lot of thick underbrush. It is not a nice old growth forest. Another example, if you go to Mingo National Wildlife Refuge and do the auto tour route around the back and get up on that high ridge and look down and look at what Mingo looks like today, it looks, it's absolutely gorgeous. And you think of it as being old growth. It's not. It has a long way to go before it's old growth. But it is surprising how much change has taken place in Mingo since the 1940s. Mingo National Wildlife Refuge wasn't established until, you know, the middle of the 20th century. So it's relatively new, and yet here in that short period of time, it is returned to a condition which is actually pretty spectacular and pretty beautiful. All right, I want to switch gears um, a little bit and talk about uh, another component of succession, and that is namely island biogeography. Um, and uh, when I'm talking about islands, I don't mean simply coastal islands or oceanic islands. I also am referring to mountaintops and, and any sort of habitat island. Uh, but a lot of what we know about island biogeography and about succession um, comes from a couple of uh, interesting events. Um, Krakatoa um, erupted back in 1883 um, and resulted in a complete defaunation of, of the island. Um, and people have been since then returning to that particular island and explore and and looking at and monitoring uh, the changes in um, in recolonization and establishment of biological communities. Uh, the same thing happened at uh, Mount St. Helens back in 1980. And I know that predates all of you, but it was a pretty spectacular event when um, Mount St. Helens erupted. Uh, there were lots of warnings. Uh, people were advised, um, you know, that the mountain was unstable and all of that. There were some people that refused to leave. And uh, I suppose if you dig hard enough, you can find them all encased in the ash and the lava um, that resulted. Um, but uh, what we're interested in here is how islands are recolonized uh, after they've been uh, wiped out, right? So that we can use that to sort of understand uh, how um, island biogeography works. So there are a couple of things which are obvious, and one of those is area, right? Uh, if you think about an island, um, an oceanic or a, a coastal island, think for example of uh, the Catalina or the, the Channel Islands in California, a series of islands right off the coast of Southern California, uh, some of them are big and some of them are small. Um, now think about an animal which is going to disperse to those islands. Um, there are a couple of things that will come into play. First is, if the island is close, it's probably going to be easier to get to than if the island is far away. Second, if the island is large, um, it represents a bigger target and will be easier to hit than if the island is small, right? So, uh, big islands that are close are going to be pretty easy to colonize. Small islands that are far away are going to be much harder to colonize. Uh, so here is a Google map of the of the coast of Southern California. Um, there along the um, uh, along the coast, you can see uh, down there south is uh, San Clemente. Uh, farther south is Carlsbad and Ocean, uh, um, Oceanside. Um, San Onofre uh, nuclear plant is down in that area. Then comes San Clemente, where Richard Nixon had his, um, his summer White House. 
uh, Dana Point, uh, popular surfing location, Huntington Beach, a little bit farther up, uh, just in uh, inland from Huntington Beach is Irvine, where University of California, Irvine is located. Uh, Long Beach, uh, Torrance. Torrance is the launching point for excursions out to Santa Catalina Island. And you can see that Santa Catalina is the, the large island that's close to shore. Uh, Santa Barbara Island is uh, a little bit farther out and smaller. And then farther up north, uh, you see um, what Santa Cruz Island, uh, Anacapa Island, um, and a couple of others there um, that are uh, of varying sizes and of varying distances from the mainland. So uh, there is sort of an interesting scenario here. Each of these islands has its own unique species of island fox. Now, um, you are probably familiar with gray foxes. I know you're familiar with red foxes. Uh, I think we saw one when we were out at Kelso. Uh, the red fox is Vulpus vulpus, um, uh, a fox that has a whole Arctic distribution. It occurs uh, throughout Canada. Um, uh, it occurs in our part of the country, too, although in our part of the country, it's, it was introduced by the English. Um, it also occurs throughout Europe and England and Ireland and Scotland and all of that. Uh, but we also have the gray fox, uh, which is... Um, obviously has a different color pattern, but is also semi-arboreal. So it, it will climb trees and, and uh, nest in trees. Well, the gray fox is Eurocyan scenario argenteus. Its sister species is Eurocyan littoralis. So there is a fox called the island fox, which is on these channel islands. So um, the island fox is evolved from our gray fox, and it's obviously a smaller version. Now, there are no trees on these islands. So the island fox somehow made it out to these islands and managed to establish itself and persist. Well, it's much smaller than the gray fox, which is an interesting phenomenon. Oftentimes, species, when they got on islands, become smaller. Um, there are no trees, so it doesn't climb, and its diet has shifted. But what's interesting is that on each of these Channel Islands, there is a different, unique species, subspecies of island fox. The island fox is Eurocyan littoralis, so littoral, right, referring to the littoral communities. So Eurocyan littoralis. So the big question becomes, how the heck did the island foxes get out there? Well, uh, it's unlikely that they would have just that that the that they would have just um, that a gray fox would have just started swimming out and hit one of these islands, right? Just for grins and giggles, uh, that doesn't seem very reasonable. It is possible that they were sunning themselves on a on a log and the on a snag right that was on the beach, washed down from Oregon or something. The tide came in, they washed out, and then they followed the currents right, and just by chance alone, they got to one of those islands. That's referred to as sweepstakes rafting, and that's the idea that we use to explain, for example, how. Um, iguanas, marine iguanas, got to the Galapagos Islands. Obviously, there are no marine iguanas on the mainland, but the green iguanas would have sunned themselves on the beach, got carried out by the waves, you know, by a rising tide, and drifted on a log or something out to uh, the Galapagos Islands. We envision the same sort of thing happened here. The alternative is that God put them there, right, which um, is possible, I suppose, but it's not testable. So at any rate, uh, they got there. We can look at um, this whole idea of this target, right, as 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 being important by looking at the relationship we have right here, where S is number of species, C is going to be a constant, A is area of the island, and then Z is some constant. If you look at this, and you take the logarithm of this, you realize that this becomes, if you take the log of both sides, it becomes the equation of a line. So all we're doing here is describing this relationship as a logarithmic relationship, a regression relationship between island area and number of species that get to the island. So as the area increases, the number of species that can be on the island 
increases as well. And that's just because the island is a bigger target. Well, it turns out that uh, you can do this sort of analysis for lots of different island systems and for lots of different groups of animals, including amphibians and reptiles and, and insects and all of that sort of stuff. And when you do it, it turns out that that, that coefficient, that z, is always about 0 0.3, which is, which is kind of interesting. And in fact, we can look at these relationships for a number of different systems, and let's do that. Here, if we look at amphibians and reptiles on the Lesser Antilles, well, I guess we're going to include uh, Cuba and Hispaniola, so the, through the Antilles, not just the Lesser, but also the Greater Antilles. Look at area on the x-axis and look at number of species. And these are just um, amphibians and reptiles. Notice how tight that relationship is. Well, this is exactly that, that relationship that we were talking about. You take the log, the x-axis is log, the y-axis is log, right? So as the area increases, the number of species increases too. There is another question on your mini exam, right? What's the relationship between area, or rather, what's the relationship between number of species and island area? Uh, we can look at the same relationship for area um, and number of plant species, uh, flowering plant species in England. It's exactly the same sort of relationship. And we see exactly the same sort of relationship when we look at area and number of bird species in North America. So the point is, as area increases, the number of species increases as well. Now, for North America here and for um, and uh, the other systems as well, we're not talking necessarily about oceanic or, or coastal islands. We're talking about habitat islands. And, and I'll say more about that in just a moment. So you can have a mountaintop represents an island. You can have a glade, right, in Missouri represents a habitat island. So it doesn't have to be uh, something that's surrounded by water. So the parameter values that we come up with uh, for that little equation um, are going to depend uh, on a couple of things. Uh, one of the things is going to be how many species are in the pool of possible colonists um, and things of that sort. Uh, also, whether it's a, a habitat island or, or an oceanic island or something of that sort. But my point is that that relationship tends to hold pretty solidly. Um, here, uh, what I want to do now is show you uh, what it looks like out in the Great Basin. Here is the map of the Great Basin. Um, so that's Nevada. I know it's not to scale, right? But there's Nevada, California off to the left, right? Nevada right next to California. Um, and as you, as you look at that, you see all of these numbered uh, structures there in the middle. Those are mountain ranges within the Great Basin. So the Great Basin is a desert, and here in the midst of this desert, you have these mountain ranges. Some of these mountain ranges are relatively tall. Um, and what you end up with at the lower elevations, you end up with sagebrush. Um, and as you get up in higher elevations, you end up with ponderosa pine and, and boreal sorts of forests. So if you get up high enough, then you get up into the firs and things of that sort. Well, the species that are on these mountaintops then are in these habitat islands surrounded by unsuitable habitat. So there are chipmunks, for example, on some of these mountaintops, which have been isolated since the Pleistocene on tops of these islands. So there is no gene flow from one of these islands to the next because the chipmunk is in this forest habitat it can't cross a desert habitat to get to the next mountaintop. There's simply nothing to eat in the intervening distance, and it'll be picked off by predators. So in a very real way, these islands are, or these mountaintops, represent habitat islands. Now for a mammal or something of that sort, it's going to be pretty difficult. For a bird, it's very different. For an insect, it's very different. So there's been a lot of research looking at these mountaintops, 
comparing birds with with mammals, with lizards and snakes and insects and all of that. But all of them, regardless of which group you're talking about, they follow these basic island biogeographic patterns. It's all a function of area and distance. The closer you are to another island or to the mainland, the easier it is to get colonized. The farther away you are, the more difficult it is to be colonized. The bigger you are, the bigger target you are, the more easily it is to be colonized. The smaller you are, the more difficult it is to be colonized. And there is another question for your mini exam. What are the effects of distance and area on probability of colonization? So here again, uh, and these are for sky islands in the Great Basin for birds and mammals. Um, and these are for habitats above an elevation of 7,500 feet. So this is going to be uh, at that at those latitudes. This is going to be already moving above um, um, above the ponderosa pine, and you're now into the firs. So. Um, uh, the spruce trees. Uh, it's a fundamentally different habitat than when you're in the in the ponderosa pine. Uh, this is, you know, cl almost cloud forest kind of kind of stuff. Uh, but notice the relationship is significant in both cases, um, and notice that the number of species increases linearly, log linearly, uh, with increasing habitat area. That's simply because the more area you have the bigger the target habitat is. And also, if you think back to our other discussions of community sorts of parameters, uh, the bigger the habitat, the more individuals you can have in the population, right? The more stable the population, and then the lower the probability of extinction. So when we're thinking about um, things like island foxes, uh, and here's a, a photograph of an island fox, and you see how much it looks like just a traditional sort of um, gray fox that we have. So ours is Eurocyon scenario argentius, and this is uh, Eurocyon littoralis. It's essentially just a smaller version, much more gracile. It doesn't have trees to climb. Somehow it got to the Channel Islands of California, and they've been isolated sufficiently long so that each island has its own unique subspecies. And here you see what those channel islands look like. This is, uh, I think this is Catalina. Uh, there's not a whole lot of human activity uh, on these islands. Some of the islands are um, now a national park, uh, so with restricted access. And even when you get onto Catalina, you don't have ready access to the entire island. At some point, um, Feral hogs were introduced to the islands. Um, one of our former faculty members here in biology, um, Blake McCann, um, he was our wildlife biologist, and he was responsible for extirpation of, of um, feral hogs on Catalina Island. Uh, he killed the last pig on, on Catalina. Uh, there are also bison on those islands. Uh, it's not clear how the bison got there. Um, the Hearst family, I don't know if you probably don't re recall, well, of course you don't recall, you weren't alive then, um, but uh, the Symbionese Liberation Army um, was a, what, a, a group that became labeled as a terrorist group in uh, back in the 60s and 70s. Patty Hearst was kidnapped by them. Patty Hearst, her father was uh, the Hearst newspaper empire. Uh, he had a castle on Santa Catalina Island. It, it's an interesting, interesting, interesting place. A lot of history and but the cool thing, obviously, is the island biogeography aspect and, and the foxes on the islands. So the question then becomes, can we, can we uh, use that sort of information to build a model for island, uh, for species diversity, island biogeography? And the answer is absolutely. Um, and that was actually done by two people. We've already talked a little bit about Robert MacArthur, um, all of his stuff about competition and whatnot. Um, and E.O. Wilson, the fellow who's responsible, the, the Harvard biologist uh, who's responsible for all the work on eusocial insects and ants, uh, and that giant volume on um, on uh, on um, all the life history theory and whatnot. So evolutionary life history theory in in 
in animals and plants. Um, but these two gentlemen came up with a, a really cool uh, book that they published through the Princeton University Press. Um, and now it seems intuitively obvious, but at the time it was pretty groundbreaking. Uh, and that work essentially gives us the following graph. So here you see on the x-axis is number of species present. Um, and S is the equilibrium number of species. Uh, and then P um, at the far end uh, is the size of the species pool. So that would be uh, the number of species on the mainland that could potentially make it out to these islands. Uh, and then on the y-axis, we have this rate. And there are two things we're looking at. One is the immigration rate of new species. Uh, and the other is the extinction rate. So just because you've made it to an island doesn't mean you're going to persist there. Um, there is a likelihood that you're going to go extinct. So where these two curves intersect, that's going to be the equilibrium number of species on the island. Well, there are lots of things that are going to influence um, this immigration rate and this extinction rate. And those things are going to be island size. And the, the obvious two are going to be island size and, and distance from the mainland. And here you can see um, some additional curves that are drawn in there to sort of reflect that idea. So on the right, um, notice we have um, extinction, uh, the extinction curve and the, uh, the extinction curves and the immigration curves on the left, right? Uh, and then notice on the right that uppermost extinction curve uh, is for small islands and the lowest most extinction curve is for large islands. So in other words, if you're a small island, the extinction rate is going to be higher than if you're a large island. So the bigger you are as an island, the lower the extinction rate is. Well, why is that? Well, simple. Big islands have bigger populations. Bigger populations have more genetic diversity. Bigger populations are less susceptible to to events that might wipe out the population. If a disease sweeps through the population and the population is large, as on a big island, the likelihood that everyone dies is lower. If the population is small, right, on a small island, right, then and a disease works through the population, the likelihood that everybody dies is much higher. So it, it's clear that the extinction rate should be lower on a big island than on a small island. Now, in terms of immigration, if the island is close, the immigration rate is going to be higher. It's an easier target to hit. If the island is far away, then it's going to be harder to hit. So the immigration rate should be low. So now you can use this little diagram here to figure out what would be the immigration rate under a couple of conditions. Well, let's look at a small island that is far away. And there, look where those two lines intersect. And it's going to be at that intersection point far to the left-hand side. Now compare that with a near island that is big. And notice how the number of species present is going to be far over to the right. So in other words, the important point here is simply that island size and distance from the mainland are going to determine the, the equilibrium number of species that you find on the island. So kids, that's all she wrote. Um, there is just the one uh, final question on the exam. Um, this, uh, this semester did not go, uh, turn out the last half at least, uh, as I would have liked, but there it is. We don't have control over all of that. Um, I hope that you stay safe. I hope that you use the knowledge uh, that you've learned as a biologist to uh, know enough who to listen to and who not to listen to in terms of politicians versus scientists. Uh, keep your distance, keep safe. Um, and if you get the opportunity, go outside, go west, go north, visit the desert, uh, visit the Tetons, um, get out there and experience life. Uh, just make make use of, of the opportunities that have been, been presented to you. So um, 
this what you see here in this image is one of my favorite places in the in the in the whole wide world. Uh, these are the Grand Tetons.